got a Sun Solaris. Solaris? Solaris. Owner says, noisy. Reverb does not work. Vibrato does not work. Would like me to make it work, but he wants me to call him with an estimate. So, for those of you who don't know this already, I don't have a crystal ball for me to even open it up and see what's wrong to get the give the estimate takes time. So there, that's one of the reasons there is a bench fee. Um, let's see what's going on with this. In my experience, sun apps are really on the flimsy side with a lot of kind of crucial mistakes. Let's see if this one has dodged any of those bullets. All right, really flimsy reverb cable connections. No connections on the foot switches. I don't know whether that's necessary for the tremolo. Notice these RCA jacks are on little cards that have been riveted to the chassis. Also notice there is a circuit breaker here, which does not feel like it's working properly. It feels like it's just kind of where it is. Um, does not have a fuse holder. This is something that Trainer also did. And the trouble is you may need, have an app that needs, oh, say a three amp fuse, but they just stuck a five amp circuit breaker in there. So circuit breakers will often protect against a dead short, but won't protect against an overcurrent situation. So by the time you realize, hey, there's a dead short, something burned which caused that dead short, a fuse could say, hey, the operating current has gone up. Let me uh, shut that down before something burns, before something creates a dead short. Uh, the other problem with circuit breakers is that they have a finite lifespan. And once they are past their prime, because they are mechanical, they no longer do anything at all. I would not be surprised if this is defective, but it certainly should be changed out for an actual fuse. Warning. The reverb unit on this amplifier is equipped with a locking mechanism to operate. Make sure your unit is unlocked. The unit is unlocked, sorry. That may be the cause of no reverb. We'll get to that. Uh, do not remove chassis. No user serviceable parts. Refer service to qualified service center. Well, I guess that's just going to have to be me. Let's get this chassis out of here and see what's up. Okay, a honking big power transformer. Two old Tung Saw 6550s. A honking big output transformer. Big old original multi-section canton cap. Three preamp tubes. Some lovely cauliflower coming out of that cap. Some coming out of that cap, so that all the electrolytics need to be changed. No surprise. This is a lot of fun on Suns. Let's see if I can get this to focus better. This little multi-section strip that they do. Those uh, CDE film caps, in my experience, do not last under voltage. The black cats. People pay crazy money for them in Les Pauls. Uh, you won't hear any difference, but you, you spend enough for a cap, a tone cap and a guitar. You'll, you'll, you'll swear that you did once you spend that money. But, uh, you know, people stick these things in Les Pauls and stuff. That's fine. Uh, there's no voltage in a guitar, so a cap can be leaky, and you just, uh, and it still works, kind of, sort of. People think it has magic. A tropical fish cap there. Those often have problems. A whole bunch of film caps on the input section. Pretty standard stuff. The joy in these is to find ways to mount the new caps since those old firecracker caps are no longer available. And there are a lot of caps in this amp that need to be replaced. And that's something I'll talk to the owner about because uh, it's all doable. At the end of the day, you can sink a lot of money into getting one of these restored. And I'm not sure that the payoff is there at the end of the day. Well, I measured the fuse, uh, not fuse, sorry, the circuit breaker. And there's zero ohms and it breaks, but it mechanically sounds noisy, like parts are moving more than they should. I don't trust it. So uh, here's the thing with amps like this. Giving an estimate for what this will cost to repair takes a lot of time to get it all together. I've got to say, okay, 
That's a 20 microfarad, 600 volt cap. Does it need to be 600 volts? If it needs to be 600 volts because of the B plus in this app, then I've got to make a new uh, replacement for that. That's 247 microfarad caps in series that can handle, you know, 700 to 1,000 volts. Um, it'll be a functional equivalent to that. And I got a plan on how to attach it in here. Same for over here. I've got to uh, take out the caps like this uh, death cap that don't need to be there. All these caps, each one, I've got to find the value necessary. It's a 50 microfarad. I don't, I can't see the voltage rating. I have to take it out to see the voltage rating. And then I got to find a 47 microfarad that'll fit there. And I don't think I can reuse this clip. Uh, I've got to find each one of these little electrolytics throughout the entire amp. And it just takes time. So it can take an hour to an hour and a half to get a bill of materials together to do this service. Um, and so you're paying me, if you want an accurate estimate on an amp like this, you have to pay me two, three hours just to see whether you want to do it. Um, so I, ch I tend to ballpark this. I am, I'm thinking that the parts for this amp will probably range from $75 to $100, if nothing is wrong with the tubes. And that's just a, a sense I have after doing this for a while. Um, and part of that is some of these parts I will get from one vendor, other parts I'll get from another vendor, and each one of those vendors is going to be at least $9 shipping, probably $9 from one, like $15 from another, you know, so that's, that's 25, 30 bucks right there just in shipping because no one vendor has all the parts necessary for an app like this. And then once I get it all powered on, and you say I change all the electrolytics, and I measure these one watt carbon comps, and I know that they're not the values, they don't measure the actual value, value that's indicated by the stripes. Um, there's a whole bunch of them throughout the app, and I replace all those with, say, metal oxide, two watts or three watts. I do all that. All the things I know ahead of time need to be replaced. And get a new power cable, actually it has a fine power cable. Make sure the power cable is attached correctly put in a fuse holder, at that point the amp is safe to power on. Well then, is there another layer to it? What if some of the film caps are bad? What if the, what, there's a bad pot? What if there's a, a, a really noisy microphonic socket? What if it needs new tubes? So I can't predict the future. You know, it's like right now the car is unsafe to power on. And once we can power it on and the engine's running, then we'll find out if the tires need to be uh, realigned. It's that kind of thing. So there are layers to this. Now, if someone brings in a, a fender from the same era, a 70s fender, or a 60s fender, or a 50s fender, or a 70s Marshall, I know what everything's going to cost in that really fast because I've done a lot of those, and I have all the necessary bill materials. If I get in a super, super reverb, I've got my super reverb bill materials. If someone brings in an ultra linear super reverb, I've got a separate bill of materials for that. I've already done that research and I've saved all that information. But when you get a Sun Solaris or a Gibson Hawk or something, you know, sometimes you've got to start the clock all over again. Speaking of which, let's go to the next amp in the does this make sense to fix category. Here we have a genuine Ibsen Hawk. I was tempted to make a really bad theater joke, but only about 10 of you would get it, and you'd probably hate me for it. Anyway, these old Hawks, the GA25 RVT, they're kind of built on a shoestring budget to begin with. Everything in, the, in it exudes low quality. I don't think that Gibson ever really respected their uh, customers when it came to their amps, and uh, they just went farther and farther afield from what... Uh, the zeitgeist was at the time um, that Fender and for a time Magnetone were really, really l latching onto. Gibson was just kind of going the other way, ending up more towards the Valco end of things. But anyway, I spoke to the owner of this amp and I said, yeah, I can restore it. I don't know that you'll like the sound enough to justify what it might cost. But he said, well, I think it'd be really cool to have it and have it working. And he asked me if I'd take a look. And I said, well, yeah, yeah, I will. I mean, everything can be fixed. Uh, it's just a matter of price 
and what you get for your money. So let's see where this one ends up in that scale. Alright, like so many Gibsons from this era, the foot switch is permanently attached, which makes it a lot of fun to have on the bench, let me tell you. I'm going to get this rear panel out that's kind of wedged in place here, if I can. Well, it's really wedged in here. I don't think I can get it out, but I can detach the reverb cables from the tank and leave the rear panel here for now. Let's see, to get the chassis out, I need to remove one nut that holds the speaker on, because there's a little bracket attached there that holds the uh, reverb cables in place. And of course, the speaker does not have a jack on the amp. It attaches direct to the output transformer, so I've got to desolder those connections. So once I get this out, I've got to disconnect the wires to this massive uh, Jensen 15-inch Alnico speaker. Notice a really big speaker with a really tiny magnet. And again, you know, we could get everything done in this amp and find out that the speaker is shot. Let's see, are these wrapped or just tucked in? Just tucked in with a little tiny suggestion of a hook. Nothing really secure about it. All right, now I can get the chassis out and there are two screws on either side for that. Let me uh, do this off camera because probably be some unflattering angles of my butt if I do it right now. Son of a... Well, Gibson, you got me again. Like that uh, 60s from about the same era, Skylark. I've got to remove the entire front baffle to you know, get this chassis out. The chassis doesn't pull out the front, and the chassis doesn't slide out here because there's just obstructions. So I've got to reattach this chassis uh, to the cabinet and then remove the baffle, and then I can pull the chassis out from the front. Why did Fender dominate the amp market starting in the 60s? Hmm. No one will ever know. Okay, finally got it out. I think I could have opened up about 10, 15 twin reverbs in the time it took me to get this one open, but almost there now. Still got to remove this metal panel like you'd find on an Ampeg. All right, let's see what joys await us. All right, starting down at the power end, besides all the cobwebs, the most obvious thing is that capacitor here has spewed its guts. Mmm, tasty. As a rule of thumb, all three of these caps would be from the same era, same year. So if this one's exploited, these two are not far behind, so those all need to get changed out. The rest of it actually looks pretty straightforward. Little caps like this aren't always good in these things. And uh, I've got loose hardware, obviously, at least on that one pot. Not oh, more than one. That's all relatively easy to do. Question is whether these ceramic disc caps are all good. And what I don't see, which I was dreading seeing, was one of those T filter cards that Gibson was using. In this era, there's one in, in that uh, later Skylark I'll, I'll put in, in the video right here for you to see. It's like a brown manila envelope kind of looking thing. And uh, it just sucks all the joy out of Mudville tonally. And these things often come alive if you bypass or remove them. But this one doesn't seem to have that problem, so that's good. So I will make a note of the uh, cap values needed, and some resistors that can be prettier than this. And talk to the owner. Needs a grounded power cable, and the fuse holder is at least loose, if not defective. We'll figure that out. And I'll see if uh, there's any damage to these pot bushings. Here where they've been loose for who knows how many years. And once those pots are loose and you turn them from the other side, the entire pot wants to turn. I can stress out uh, any uh, thing soldered to them, like those resistors there. I'll grab that Skylark and show you that T-filter card I'm talking about.
Here's the beast in question. It's a little set of components all encased in epoxy or whatever, plastic, whatever they used. So it's a whole bunch of components in one little card. And uh, Gibson just started putting them in their amps like uh, chiclets or something. And everyone that's added to an app makes the app sound that much worse. So that's probably not long for this world. Man, Gibson uh, guitars are fantastic, or can be. The amps are a bit of a potluck.